Okay, so the doctrine of godliness is the teaching on how to live godly. Okay? The teaching on how to live godly. How to live like God. All right? So we're going to be building upon the scriptures that we're going to forge forward and we're going to continue to elaborate on this and tie a whole bunch of scriptures together as we pioneer forward and build upon these fundamentals. Does anybody know what the very first doctrine of God was or is in the Bible? The very first doctrine of God in the Bible. Anybody know? <laughs> Come on, give me some guesses out there. What is the very first instruction of God in the Bible? Think about it. The very first thing God instructed man to do. There you go, Jesus is God. There you go, you guys are getting it. Right there. He commanded them to stay away from that tree, didn't he? That's the very fir first doctrine of godliness in the Bible. A teaching on how to obey God, to live pure, to live holy. That's the very first instruction from God right there. Hallelujah. So why is the doctrine of God, uh, godliness so important? Why is the doctrine of godliness so important? The teachings on how to live. Why is that so important? What does it matter if we're saved by grace? What does it matter if we're saved by the free gift? What does it matter if we put our faith in Jesus? What, what does the doctrine of godliness, you know, see, this is where people are whew, taking a left turn at Albuquerque. This is where people are going divergent, and this is where people are starting to go the other way on it. Because today we're going to talk about the free gift of salvation on, and how the doctrine of godliness ties into the grace, ties into the free gift, and how importantly intertwined they are and indispensably connected that they are. You, you can't have the free gift without submitting to the teachings and instructions on how to live godly. Can I get an amen? I want to say that again because... This is so, so very, very, very important. I'll say that again. You cannot have the free gift. And we're going to talk about that word free in a minute. And you might be surprised to see what the Bible really says. You can't have the free gift of salvation if you do not submit to the doctrine of godliness. The teachings on how to live godly. Now we're going to, we're going to fine tune this. We're going to elaborate on it. We're going to really investigate it very, very closely. We're going to learn how the doctrine of godliness ties into the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation. Saved by grace through faith. Hallelujah. How does the doctrine of godliness, the teachings on how to live, tie in to the saved by grace through faith? The doctrine of salvation. We're going to take a look at that very, very closely. We're going to find out how the doctrine and teachings on how to live tie into the free gift, the doctrine of salvation. Again, let's go over some scriptures. Let's go over some scriptures. What does Jesus say? I mean, what does the Bible say about the teachings of godliness? Remember this? If any man teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words or the words of Jesus and to the doctrine of which is according to godliness, right? What, is it, what does it say? If any man teaches otherwise, he is proud, knowing nothing, doting about questions and strifing over words, creating envy and strife and railings and arguments, and that's what these people do. That's what these people do. You understand what I'm saying? But brothers and sisters, if you do not agree if people do not agree with the doctrine of godliness, the teaching on how to live godly, the teaching to live pure, the teaching to repent, the teaching to live holy, the teaching to turn away from all sin and live perfect. Not that I'm there yet. I'm not there yet. But I believe. I believe in the teaching. I believe it is possible. Again, I'm not there yet, but I believe in the teachings of Jesus, and I believe it is possible. Okay? There's a lot of people who are foolish who don't want to consent 
or acknowledge the teachings of Jesus or the doctrine on how to live godly, and they'll tell you that hyper-grace, grace alone, is all you need, and it's grace itself that's bringing you this teaching. I need, I need to say that again. They'll tell you that you don't need to consent to the doctrine of godliness on how to live, because they say that grace alone saves you when they don't understand that it is grace bringing you this teaching. Do you understand that, brethren? This teaching comes from grace. You can't ignore the doctrine of godliness and say you're saved by grace. Because this teaching comes from grace. Once you understand how grace saves you, you'll understand that the doctrine is essential in your life. The teachings are so critical, indispensably important, that without these teachings, and without you submitting to these teachings, grace is being wasted on you. Grace has come to bring this doctrine, this teaching of Christ into your ears. It is grace that's delivering this into your spirit right now. Are you receiving this doctrine of godliness into your heart? Are you welcoming this doctrine into your heart? Amen. That's a beautiful passage, Bob. That's somebody who knows, who's founded on the right foundation. When you know where to go and find that scripture right there, so essential, powerful, that proves that grace is the one saving us. Grace is the one saving us. We are indeed saved by grace, but the way they present it, they have no idea that grace has called you to interact, that grace has demanded that you submit, partake, obey, and do. And grace has defined what faithfulness means. Grace has defined what faithfulness means. You're not faithful in Jesus just because you say you believe in him. Because you have a t-shirt on. Because you have a plaque on your wall. Because you have a PhD and you go to church. You're not faithful just because of the religious activities and dead words that come out of your mouth. No, grace has defined what faithfulness is. We're saved by grace through faith, and God has defined that. But man has come along and believed the doctrines of men, the doctrines of devils. In the Garden of Eden, Satan was the first one to speak against the, God, the doctrine of godliness. He said, no, you won't die. He started spitting out lies, doctrines of lies and corruption and deception. And today men believe the teachings and doctrines of men rather than the doctrine of God. The teachings of God. They would rather believe in a different kind of grace. An inactive grace. A superficial grace. A man-made, imaginative, make-believe, fairy tale grace. A child book story fairy tale grace instead of a double edged sword grace instead of a fire, a consuming fire grace instead of a grace that demands you lay your life down a grace that crucifies your old ways. Brothers and sisters, that's the grace I'm talking about. That's the real meat of the word. The kind of grace that is a rock that will smash your life to pieces and then water you until the seed that God has put there grows. And that water of the word will grow that seed. And that seed will produce long, deep, strong roots into the good soil that God has put there. And then the branches will be so strong. And the leaves and the fruit will produce many flavors. 
and man cannot chop it down. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you listen to the teachings of God, you will be like a tree planted by the waters. You will. It's so true. If you eat his words, eat his flesh and drink his blood like Jesus said, only a spiritual man can understand that. You're eating the words of your television set. You're eating the words of your church. You're eating the words of these corrupt Bibles. You're eating the words of this worldly music. You're eating a different spirit. You're taking part of a different spirit, a different doctrine. Not the teachings of Jesus, the true and living Jesus. Brothers and sisters, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Look what Paul says. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Oh, they're trying to entice you away. The devil's trying to make it, make it seem like grace is one something different. He's trying to make it seem like grace is something different than what it really is. A teacher on how to live. Grace is a teacher on how to live. He says, beware lest any man spoil you, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiment of the world, and not after Christ. You see that? Oh, you start listening to the men and the doctors and devils. You will be led astray. We have to grow up in Christ. We have to grow up and train, train, daily training, training those eyes, brother, not to look at that girl's butt. You train your eyes. You train your, your body. You train yourself in such a way that you know that your body is getting ready to be sexually active and, and wants to rise up. You, you, you train your mind to understand when your body's starting to get that feeling. You train yourself on how to combat that through the Spirit. You train yourself, brethren. We're in training. We have to grow. Why? Why do we have to grow? That we henceforth be no more children. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and they wait to deceive. So that we're not tossed around but like ignorant little children by every teaching that comes along, by every Mandela effect, by every CERN project, by every philosophy and multiple universe teaching that's out there. Give me a break. People will believe anything, brethren. They will. They'll believe anything. So we have to grow up and be aware of these things and go to the teachings of Jesus instead of the teachings of men. And what does Jesus say? Jesus said, be perfect, stop sinning. And John reiterates that with this scripture. Look at this scripture. Do you want to know if you have God in your life or not? Do you want to know if you have God in your life or not? Then look at this scripture and read this scripture with me, brethren. Whosoever sins, transgresses, whoever, whosoever practices sin, whosoever practices sin is what that's saying, and does not abide in the teachings of Christ. There's two things there. That person does not have God. But if you abide in the teachings of God, you have both, not only the Son do you have, but you have the Father as well. Because if you listen to Jesus, you have the Father. That's how we receive the Father and the Son, is that we listen to the teachings of the Son, and we do what He says, and we have God by obeying the Son of God. We have God. Those who obey Jesus have God. That's how you know if you're born of God or not. Do you pray? No, we don't all practice sin, brother. No, we don't. No, we don't all practice sin. We might sin sometimes, but we don't practice sin. Who practices sin in here? 
Type of six in if you practice sin, and we'll lay hands on you. Do you practice sin daily? Okay, then you're still a sinner. You're a sinner too. I'm going to ask you guys to stop practicing sin. Can you stop practicing sin? Let's do it. Let's do a little test. We've done it in here before. You guys that type the six in, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that you can stop sinning. Are you ready? I'm talking about practicing sin. I mean, you, you, you can't stop sinning. Not even, you know, people that practice sin can't stop sinning. Someone who cannot stop sinning, Rafi. Okay, let's do a test. Uh, stop typing, everybody. I'm going to do a test. For the next 30 seconds, are you guys ready? Okay, all right, listen, I'm going to prove to you through the grace of God that we can stop sinning. Are you ready? For the next 30 seconds, I want you to live perfect, holy, like Jesus. Ready? Okay, go. Hallelujah. Look at that. I've gone five seconds in holiness. Come on, let's keep going. Hallelujah. Look at that. We're doing it. I've been perfect for 10 seconds. Oh, praise the Lord. Come on, we can do it. 15 seconds. Let's go. I haven't sinned yet. Come on, I have you. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't sin. Come on now. 15 seconds. I've been living holy. Hallelujah. Come on, guys. Hold on there. No, that's not sinning. Having a bad thought's not sinning. Carrying it out is sinning. Cast that thought out, sister. That's not sinning. Cast it out as soon as it gets in there. Cast it out. Brothers and sisters, it's not a sin to have a thought pop into your head. Look at that. Look at that. The whole group is living holy right now. Look at that. Look at that. Now, can we go a minute? Can we go a minute? Can we go two minutes? Can we go an hour? Brothers and sisters, do you see my point? Type a seven in if you get my point. Please, please tell me that you're growing in revelation. All right. So most of you understand, most 99.9% .9 of you understand that you can stop sinning. So most of you understand that. Okay, listen, brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to get you to understand is how are we how are we able to do that? How were we able to stop sinning? Does anybody have the answer? Does anybody have the answer to why we were able to stop sinning? No. Through Christ, grace of God. There you go. There you go. Who just taught you just now? Who just taught you how to live holy? Who just taught you that? The Holy Spirit. Jesus, the grace. The grace just taught us that. Many of you already knew that. And so you're practicing. What are you practicing? You're practicing holiness, aren't you? We're not practicing sin. We're practicing holiness. Can I get an amen? If you're practicing sin, brethren, if you're practicing sin, you're not a saint. You're still in darkness. We are not, we're not in darkness. I didn't say we're perfect yet. Don't, don't get confused. Don't get confused. We're not perfect yet. I said we're practicing holiness. We're practicing holiness, saved by grace. You get it, sister? I hope you do, sister. I've seen you growing a lot, saved by grace. I want you to keep growing, little sister. I love you. I love seeing new people come in here and grow. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. That's what the doctrine of godliness is. How to practice godliness in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, now let's talk about the free gift. What is all this talk about living a certain way and obeying the teachings of Jesus? Why, what's, what's up with that? I mean, salvation is a free gift. You don't have to do anything, right? Isn't that what they say? Isn't that what they say, brethren? Salvation's a free gift. You don't have to do anything. Now, I want to show you this. I want you to see this. Okay, I want you to read this with me and I want you to grow with me. Check this out. The word free gift, the term free gift 
is only in the Bible three, three times. The entire Bible three times. And one of them, it's not really there. It's in italic, so it's really only there two times. I want to show you the scriptures that it's in. Here we go. Romans chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. Talks about a free gift. Okay, it's talking about how, but not as the offense, so also it is a free gift. For if through the offense one many be, be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abundant, abounded unto many, and not as it was by one that sinned. But that's a tongue twister. So if the gift for judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is as many offense unto justification. So what it's basically saying is because one man sinned, many men died. And because one man, like Jesus, because of one man, many men received the free gift. Basically, that's what that's saying. Okay? But if you look up the word free gift, what I want to do is look up that word free gift in the Greek. I want to look it up, see what it really means. That's why I wanted to show you where it was at. I didn't really need to read it. I just, my point is this. You can study that passage yourself and see what it's talking about. I don't mean to brush over it. And it's talking about how Adam sinned and many men died and how Jesus took care of that. One man took care of that and many men received the free gift. But it uses the word free gift. I want to show you what it means in the Greek. Can you guys look at this? There's the word. To show favor. A gift of grace. An undeserved benefit. I want you to understand when the Bible says free what it's really talking about. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about a gift of grace, an undeserved benefit. An undeserved benefit. Now, God has died for the whole world, has he not? God has provided, God has provided his blood for the whole world. My question to you today is if it's really that kind of free, then why are people still going to hell? Why are people still going to hell? It's free. Yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, that's a very good point, Landons. Landons, you, you can reject the free gift, can't you, brothers and sisters? Can, can you guys understand that you can reject the free gift? You don't have to take the free gift, can, do you? You don't have to take the free gift of God. Okay, so the question is, how do we receive the free gift? How do we receive the free gift? You see? So let's continue to read this. Through the promise of God, we have an opportunity to be saved. We have an opportunity. The free gift, brothers and sisters, is an opportunity. It's a chance to be saved. It's free. It's something you can't do for yourself. The blood of Jesus can wash you clean. It is a gift. It is free. Huh? That's wonderful. We can reject it or we can come under it. How do we come under it? The gift is an opportunity. God has made a way. Hallelujah. God has made a way. It's, this is an opportunity to receive the righteousness of God. You have an opportunity to receive the gift of eternal life. You have an opportunity if you believe and obey properly, if you un understand what faith really is, if you know how to come under it, if you know how to receive it, if you know how to accept it, if you know how to put your faith in it right, you can be saved by this free gift. You see, our understanding of what free is is different than God's. Brothers and sisters, you think free is winning a lottery ticket. You can sit on the couch and watch TV all day and get rich because you won a lottery ticket. But how many of you know that even winning a lottery ticket, pay attention to this, brethren. This might shock you a little bit. But how many of you know that even if you win $10 million in a lottery ticket, how many of you know you still got to get off the couch? Are you listening? You still got to get off the couch. You still got to go down and cash it in, which means you got to get in your car and drive through traffic. You still got to what? Hold on to the ticket. What if you let the ticket go out the window? 
Are you going to be rich if the ticket flies out the window? Huh? What happens if the ticket flies out the window? Are you still going to be rich? What does it mean? You got to hold on to the ticket, don't you? You got to protect that ticket, don't you? You got to preserve that ticket with fear and trembling. You guard it. You hide it. You put it in a safe. You don't let anybody take it from you. Brothers and sisters, you have to understand that that is not free, now is it? It's not free like you're thinking, now is it? It requires faithfulness. It re that's all called being faithful, brethren. That's all. Now, what do you think God's going to do to you on Judgment Day when He gives you a lottery ticket, brethren? He's given us a lottery ticket, and you didn't even get off the couch to go cash it in. What do you think your judgment's going to look like? And you couldn't even get off the couch and cash it in. God is basically looking for us to get off the couch and cash in that free gift, brethren. We have a free gift, but we got to get up and be productive. He's not going to accept you if you sit there and squander his free gift. He's not going to be approved. You're going to be a castaway. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be disqualified. It don't work that way. The free gift does not work that way. Even a lottery ticket doesn't work that way. What makes you think you can sit on the couch and not have to cash your lottery ticket in? What makes you think that? But the devil wants you to think that. The devil wants you to think you ain't got to lift a finger. Brothers and sisters, that's not what Jesus teaches. That's not what the word of God, that's not the doctrine of godliness. We got to be smarter than that, and we got to be grounded in the truth. Okay? So, in order to receive this, we have to believe properly. We've got to get off the couch. We've got to hold on. We've got to protect. We've got to endure until we get to the end. Until we cash this thing in, we've got to hold on until the end. And let me tell you something, brothers. Let me, let me put it to you this way. What if you get all the way across town... And you pull up to the front of the bank. And you're right in front of the financial institution. And you get out of your car. And you're walking down the sidewalk. Listen to me. And all of a sudden, a gust of wind comes. And a gust of wind blows that ticket right out of your hand and blows it up into the clouds and it's gone. And you're right at the edge of the door of the financial institution, ready to cash it in. You made it all the way across town. You made it through red lights and accidents. You, you've got all the way through the, the traffic jams, and you're right there at the end. But the wind, the gust of wind blows it out of your hand, brethren. What do you think is going to happen? Are you going to go into that bank and say, look, I, I made it all the way here. Uh, uh, I, I got right outside and uh, 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 the wind came and it just took it from me. Can I still get my 10 million? Can I still get it? What do you think they're going to tell you, brethren? What do you think they're going to tell you? Brothers and sisters, this is a great analogy of our calling. And this teaching comes from the grace of God. Jesus was always teaching in things you can relate to. Little parables about fishing, about planting and garden and all these things. This is a parable to you about how to hold on to your salvation. About how to be saved. About the importance of free gift versus responsibility. Free gift versus responsibility. That free gift is only good if you're responsible with it, brethren. You've got to be responsible with that free gift. Okay, so we're called to live holy. We're called to live righteous. We're called to be perfect. Now, let me tell you some good news. You ready for some good news? Oh, it's beautiful. You're going to love the Lord if you see this. Now, all that stressing, all that diligent effort, all that work is exactly... You guys ready for this? Now, I know your hearts are prepared to receive this next thing. You ready? You guys ready? We are to strive every last nerve to be perfect. But look at this beautiful promise. Look at this is only for those striving every last nerve to hold on to that lottery ticket who make it to the bank 
And along the way, they've made one mistake. Look at this. My little children, I write these things to, to you so that you stop sinning. The whole point of the letters is that you stop sinning. The whole point of the God, doctrine of godliness is that you stop sinning, that you be perfect. But look what he says. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What a beautiful, 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 beautiful promise that we are going to make mistakes along the way, but we are not practicing sinners. We do not live in darkness. We do not practice sin. We're not wicked. We don't live in iniquity. Brothers and sisters, I sin sometimes, but I am not a practicing lost sinner. I make sinful mistakes covered by the blood of Jesus. I don't take advantage of the blood of Jesus and practice sin. Brothers and sisters, if you're practicing sin in your life, if you can't go 30 seconds without sinning, you are not born of God. How do I know that? How do we know that's true, brothers and sisters, and it's not just my opinion? Where do we get that from? The Bible. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. The Spirit of God cannot sin. We just proved that. We just walked in the Spirit with our 30-second test. Now, there were no hard challenges, granted, but that's beside the point. Now you know. Now you've made a quantum leap. Now you've gotten past that I can't stop sinning to, hey, it's possible to stop sinning. So now you know that it is possible to stop sinning with a simple 30-second test. But when the challenges come, brethren, it's going to be harder. It's going to be more difficult. But we have to remember that through Christ, we can do it. We can do all things. We can still do it through Christ. We're new creatures in Christ, brethren. We're born of God. Given His Spirit. Have you been given His Spirit, brothers and sisters? Have you been given the Holy Spirit? Do you know that the Trinity lives in you? And I don't even use the word Trinity. I don't use the word Trinity because it, you know, it's not in the Bible and people like to make a big deal about it. And quite frankly, I focus on Jesus. I don't focus on the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't focus on the Holy Spirit, but we have the Holy Spirit. Look what Romans 5.5 5 says. We have been given the Holy Spirit. Look it up. Romans 5.5 5 says we've been given the Holy Spirit. John 14.23 says the Father and the Son will come live in you if you keep His words. Galatians 4.6 says you have received the Spirit of the Son. Look at that. Galatians 4.6, you received the Son. John 14.23, you received the Father and the Son. Romans 5.5, 5, you received the Holy Spirit. There's your Trinity. That's God living in me. The question is, have you been sealed by God? Have you been sealed by God? Do you want a test on how to know that? Here's how you know if you've been sealed by God. Right here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. The foundation of Christian living, the foundation of my life in Christ, the, the new life that I've been given, the new creature, my new way of living, the foundation that's been laid, that's what this is talking about. I've been sealed. It has this seal. That those, that the Lord knows me now, and let everyone that names na the name of Christ, who calls upon him, depart from iniquity. If you confess Christ as your God and your Savior, you, he's God in flesh, and you are turning from and practice turning from wickedness and practicing holiness. Confessing Christ as your God and Savior, turning from sin, you have been sealed by God. You've been sealed by God. If you're not turning from sin, but you're practicing sin, you are in danger of listen. I know God's mercy is, is amazing and mysterious and only God knows who's saved and who isn't. But the evidence that we have from the Bible is if you're acting and living like the devil, you're a child of the devil. And let me tell you something. It's a scary thing 
to look at your life, to examine your life and go, all I'm doing is sinning. All I see is sin. I can't stop sinning. That is a dreadful and terrible and frightening thing. And you should be afraid. A person that cannot stop sinning should be terrified. You should be terrified. Look what Paul says. We're going to stand before God on Judgment Day, brothers and sisters, and appear before Him. Everyone's going to give an account. Everyone's going to give an account. Everyone. Now look what he says. Look what the very next verse says. It's, you're going to give an account for the good and the bad. You think you're going to just get into heaven and you're going to hear, well done, pat on the back? No. Nope. You're going to give an account for the bad you've done also. Now look at the very next verse. Why does Paul warn people about the judgment? Why why should we know about the judgment? Look what he says in the very next verse. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You see that? Why should we be concerned about the judgment? Because they know the terror of the Lord. It is not something to dilly-dally around with, to take for granted. We should be living every single day knowing that we are about to face judgment. If you live in light of the judgment, you would live differently. You really would. Oh, praise God. Give us a revelation, Lord. Okay, we've been given an opportunity. I want to talk to you about this opportunity. Because the opportunity is so important, brothers and sisters. Before Jesus came into the world... God handled people and sin differently. Do you understand that? Let's read this together. And he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek him if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Now check this next verse out. He says, and the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Things are different now. Since Christ came into the world, things are different now. Before, God allowed people to kind of seek him out on their own. You could, if you denied your father's idols as a, a hunting and gathering tribe, some lost backwoods uh, culture, if you denied the, the, the practices of sin and you sought the creator, if you looked up into the heavens like Abraham did, Abraham denied his father's idols, didn't he? Abraham didn't worship the same gods that his father did. That's why he found favor in God's eyes. And any person, no matter where you were, in whatever country you were at, no matter what tribe you were from, if you did that, you could find God. And he winked at some of the sin back then. But now, brethren, that time is over. That time is over. Look what Jesus says now about his coming back, about how dark the world's going to get, how much more sinful, how hard it is to be going to be to find somebody who sincerely seeks the Lord. Look at this. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? It is getting darker and more wicked. And, and let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, there's only one way to be saved now. There's not any chance of people going off on their own into the woods and finding God through some experience of revelation because their hearts are so dark now that they don't even look for God like that anymore. That's what Jesus is saying. The only hope we have now for salvation is to call upon the Lord and to hear the words, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all believed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who has believed our report? 
So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is the only way to be saved. And if you have not heard the word and believed upon the message, you will not receive the spirit. That is the opening grace. That is the free gift that we have today. The teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus bring salvation. And the only way to be saved is to hear. Hear the message. You have to hear the word. You have to believe upon what you're hearing. You cannot find God in the woods. No man's heart is seeking after God that way. If anyone is saved, it's going to be because they heard the word. Not because they have randomly sought after the creator on their own. Many people are seeking, but they're not going to be able to enter in. Many people are window shopping, but they're not going to be accepted. Many people have their own flavor and imagination of God. They have their own kind of religious experience. They have their own uh, imagination. They have their own God. They believe in their own gospel. They believe in their own way. They've created their own religion. They haven't believed upon the gospel the true gospel. They believe another message, another doctrine, another doctrine of men, the doctrines of devils, and that's why we are clarifying what the doctrine of Christ is, the doctrine of godliness, and how to be saved. We want you to know and hear the truth. We want you to hear the truth and believe upon the truth so that you can receive the real spirit of God because there are many false teachings out there. There are many false gospels out there and there are many counterfeit Jesuses out there and philosophies and religions and deception. We are teaching you how to believe in the real truth. We are teaching you the real truth. Why do you think there's somebody attacking me every other week on YouTube? Why do you think there's so many videos calling me a false teacher? Just type it in. Type in Levi false teacher on YouTube and see how many pop up. Why do you think I'm on such, under such attack, brothers and sisters? Why? Because... There are not many people left preaching the truth. And I'm not special. Brothers and sisters, each and every single one of you right now can teach this same truth. Each and every single one of you that come to this chat room that are growing in the knowledge of the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ. Each and every single one of you who know how grace works and how faith is applied. Each and every one of you can go out and make your own videos and preach the gospel the same way. You're being equipped right now. You're being instructed and you're being equipped. You are disciples, not of me. We are disciples of Jesus. You need to get ready and go out and do the same thing, brothers. You're called to do this, to spread this word. I'm not the only preacher. I'm not the only one with a mouth. You know the truth. And now you must, you must spread the truth now, brothers and sisters. You must spread the truth. Hallelujah. So one of the problems we must overcome is the assumption that we have to achieve perfection on our own. The doctrine of godliness does not say you have to be perfect on your own. There is no teaching in the Bible that says that your works are perfect without Jesus. We know that we cannot be perfect on our own. We're so easily convinced that because of this that we'll always be sinners. Which is exactly what Satan wants us to believe. We must realize that God would never call us brothers and sisters. God would never say be perfect. He would never call us or instruct us to do something without equipping us first. Can I get an amen? He would never tell us to do something if he didn't expect us to do it. And if he didn't give us the equipment to do it. God doesn't work that way. He's not playing jokes on us. He literally expects us to be perfect. That means spiritually mature. Look what the Bible says. 2 Peter 1.3 
I know Brother Lyon likes this. According as his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to what? Life and what? Godliness. Look what it just said. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness, which makes sense. He should give us everything we need for godliness if he tells us to stop sinning. How can I do this, Lord God? He says, I've given you everything you need. Do you believe you have everything you need to live godly? Type a seven in. Do you believe you have everything you need to stop sinning and live perfect? Through Christ. Yes, yes. Only through Jesus. Look at this. Hallelujah. Here, here's, here's what we've been given. But to every one of us is given grace. That's how it works. Ephesians 4, 7 tells us how we can do this. Look at this. But every one of, but unto every one of us has been given according to what? A measure of the what? Gift of Christ. Christ is the gift. His body on the cross dying for us provides a way to be washed clean. If we can hold on to that lottery ticket until the end. If we can go cash it in by being obedient to him. We've been given a measure of Christ. If you've been given Jesus, if you receive the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son living in you, if you have that spirit of grace teaching you, then you're practicing holiness. And no matter how many times you slip and fall, you are in the faith. You are in the light. You are under grace and under the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't let Satan fool you by the occasional sinning, by the slipping once in a while. Don't let the devil tell you that you are a sinner because you slip and sin once in a while. That's, that's a deception. That's a sleight of hand and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. See, they're waiting for you to sin so they can go, ah <laughs> They're waiting for you to sin. They're, they're literally, instead of encouraging you, Instead of encouraging you to do better, like we do in here, instead of exhorting each other unto holiness, they're waiting for you to slip up. They're waiting for you to make a mistake so they can pounce on you and beat you up and, and just terrorize you with it and call you a sinner. Brothers and sisters, our sins do not make us sinners. Do you want a scripture that proves that to you? Type a seven, and if you want me to prove to you that, that our sin does not make us a sinner. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What did we just, what did we just see in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3? What did God just say? I've given you everything for life and godliness. Here is part of that everything. I'm going to show you something right now that's part of that everything. Here is a scripture that proves that God provides everything. Here we go. Look at this. If any man sees his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death. A brother that sins a sin that's not unto death. So you can sin a sin not unto death. He says he shall ask. He pray for him. Work together, and he shall give him life. He shall restore him. He shall help him, help him overcome it. He shall help him repent. If any man sees his brother sin a sin that's not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life. For them that sin is sin not unto death. Look at the rest of it. <clears throat> there is a sin unto death. There's a point where he says, I don't even say you should pray for that. Stop praying for that. I don't pray for the Antichrist, do you? I don't. I don't pray for the Pope. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. I just don't. There is a sin unto death. And a sin not unto death. Now he's talking about, he, uh, he's talking about a brother. Who, who is this passage talking about? A brother. Someone who confesses Christ as their God and Savior, who is what? Practicing righteousness. Brothers and sisters, if you're not practicing righteousness, you're not my brother. Uh, let me tell you that again. Let me say that again. If you're not practicing righteousness, I didn't say you had to be perfect. 
I didn't say you had to be perfect. But if you're not practicing righteousness, you're not my brother. Okay? I don't care if you call yourself a Christian or not. Look what Paul says. Look at these scriptures with me. Uh, you got to see this. Let's read this together. Let's, let's read this together. <clears throat> read this with me. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. Don't keep company with any man that is called a brother who is a fornicator, a coveter, a doubter, a railer, a drunkard, or extortioner. With such a one, don't even eat with this person. For what do I have to do to judge them that are without the church? Do we not judge them that are within the church? Look at what he says. Therefore, put away from among you that wicked person. Put away from among you that wicked person. He calls himself a brother. He goes around lusting after women. He's profane. He gets drunk. He doesn't try to stop sinning. He says he's saved by grace. He sins like a sinner. He confesses that he sins like a sinner. He calls himself a sinner. He doesn't believe he can stop sinning. And his life reflects nothing but sin. You see the difference between somebody who believes they can stop sinning and somebody who believes they cannot stop sinning? Brothers and sisters, I'm always going to check my brothers with this. If you don't believe you can stop sinning, I'm not hanging around you because I'm not going to get involved in your sinful, sticky little life. Okay? I'll work with you if you have faith. Okay? I will work with you if you believe. If you don't believe... And I'm trying and trying to help you see and you're being rebellious and you're being stubborn and you're being uh, self-willed and you're being blinded, willfully ignorant. I'm going the other way, Jack. But if you're willing, if you're teachable, what, is the, what did he say? If you see a brother sin a sin, not unto death, you shall ask. There's hope in that sin, brothers and sisters. There's hope in a sin when a brother is willing to change, willing to confess, willing to put it aside, willing to repent, willing to go to AA meetings, willing to go to counseling, willing to confess it in front of the group, willing to humble themselves, willing to be broken. If any man sees a brother sin a sin not unto death, he shall ask and God shall give him life. He shall restore that one. If you've got weaknesses in here, brothers and sisters, if you're struggling with addiction, if you're struggling with masturbation, you better be confessing it and you better be seeking prayer. You better be seeking people to help you instead of hiding it and pretending it's not there. Oh, deceived ones, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven with your hidden sins. The only hope you have is to confess it to God and get some help. Get some help. Get with people who have overcome these things and ask them to teach you through the grace of God how you did it. How did God show me how to stop masturbating? All I can do is tell you how God showed me. It may not work for you, but this is what he did for me. I've got a video on YouTube called How I Stopped Masturbating. Okay? And it's true. And it works. It worked. It's not me. It's not my brilliance. Do you think I want to do that to myself? Do you think it was my great, fantastic idea? God knows your heart better than you do. He knows what you need. He knows what will work for you. God knows what will work for you. He knew what would work for me, and that worked for me. It may not work for you. So get with somebody who God is showing these breakthroughs through, and you find a way. Get off them cigarettes. Get off that masturbation. Put down them video games. Find somebody to help you. Hallelujah. We have the mind of Christ now, brothers and sisters. You know what? This group is growing in the mind of Christ. There's not very many people that come in here who call themselves sinners anymore. When we started this group, everybody had a problem with understanding that they were saints. And now we're starting to understand. Why? Because we're growing in the mind of Christ. We're growing in the measure of the gift of Christ. We're growing in Christ, brothers and sisters. That's why. We're not carnal anymore. We're not carnal and acting like mere men anymore. Look what Paul says. I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, 
for hitherto you're not able to bear it. Neither now can you eat the meat, for you're still carnal. Whereas among you there is strife and envying and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as mere men? You walk as men. That's carnal men. Men of the flesh, not spiritual men, not spiritual men, the mind of Christ, not those who believe they can be perfect. See, here's how you can identify, brothers and sisters, here's how you can identify a carnal man and a, and a spiritual man. Are you ready? You always ask them this. Do you believe you can stop sinning through Christ? Always through Christ. Do you believe you can stop sinning through Christ? And listen for the answer. And listen for the answer. Do you, and, and the answer is, I believe I can through Jesus only. Now, I didn't say they had to be perfect. I didn't say, ask them, are you perfect yet? I said, do you believe? A spiritual person lives by faith, brothers and sisters. We live by faith. Okay? So we're teaching you how to live by faith in here and how to overcome the doubt. How to overcome the doctrines of devils and the teachings of men and live in faithfulness to God. And that's what this teaching is all about. Hallelujah. We are supposed to be growing in grace. You're given a measure of God, but if you're not growing, you're going to be backsliding. 2 Peter 3.18 says, grow in grace. Are you? Gr We're growing in here. How many people feel like they're growing in this chat room? Type a seven in. Because if you're not growing in here, you need to go somewhere where you are growing. If you can't grow in here, grow, go somewhere where you can grow. Praise the Lord. And this is all because of God's anointing and God's blessing and God's grace and God's teaching. It is not because of me. It is not because of man. You cannot get this through flesh and blood. You can only get it through God. See, our, our understanding grow, grows. It starts to make sense why Jesus would command us and expect us to obey such an impossible command as to live perfect. We start to realize that we're merely partaking in His perfection, whereby we receive the power of righteousness. Otherwise, we'd never be able to accomplish the command to be perfect. Brothers and sisters, if you do not believe you can stop sinning, why would you try? One final test, and we're going to close this Bible study out. If you don't believe, brothers and sisters, that you can stop sinning, why would you try? See, this is why it's important. Listen to me very, very carefully. This is why it's important you have the right mindset. If you think that it's possible, you're going to try to do it. If you think it's impossible, you're not going to try to do it. Let me give you an example. I want everybody to stand up in their living room hypothetically, and I want you to jump, and I want you to touch the moon. Okay? I want to measure your effort. I'm going to look at your effort. I want to see who's really trying to touch the moon. And you're going to find out that people aren't really trying to touch the moon. Why? Because they don't believe it's possible. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not going to try to touch the moon if you believe it's impossible. So what does that do? What does that have to do with the commands of Jesus? Everything. If you don't believe it's possible to stop sinning, why would you try? Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not going to try if you don't believe it's possible. But now, now, if you believe it is possible and God's holding you accountable, then you're going to put forth effort. You're going to put forth what the Bible's called striving. Every nerve in your body for a, a result. But God wants to see that kind of faith where you're striving and you're, you're stressing every nerve in your body for the finished product of perfection. That's what Jesus' teachings are. That's what grace is teaching. I don't know what kind of grace you're saved by, but my grace through Jesus says to strain every nerve for the end result. Jesus said strive to enter in. That word strive is agonizama. I'm going to show you this before we close it out. We got to go over it, over it, over it, over it every week. We got to go over this stuff until your teachers, 
I don't care if you've heard it before. I want you to teach it. I want you to know where the scripture is. I want you to have it memorized. <laughs> I don't care if you've heard it a thousand times. Do you know what verse it's in? Hallelujah. Look at that. Strive to enter in the straight gate. Strive to enter in. Now, what does that word mean? That's the words of Jesus, not my words, buddy. That's the words of Jesus. What does that word mean? Let's look it up. Agonizama. Look at this. You tell me what this says. Let's read this carefully. Look, look what this says. I guess you got to skip down a little bit. It says to contend for victory in a public game. It generally comes to mean to fight or wrestle. Now, figuratively, in John 18, 36, figuratively, it is the task of faith in preserving amid temptation and opposition. Now, look, in Timothy, it also came to mean to take pains, to wrestle as in an inward contest, straining every nerve to the utmost towards a goal. I love that definition, that teaching of Jesus. Now, how many of you love that teaching of Jesus? You see, I love that teaching. It really clarifies to me how I should be living. I love the words of Jesus. I love the impossible commands of Jesus. I love that he said, be perfect. I love that he said, cut your hand off if it doesn't stop sinning. I love that he said, strive every nerve to enter in. I love those teachings. I love them. I don't know why, but it gives me life and fire in my bones. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we believe your teachings and your doctrine through your Son, Jesus. We ask that you continue to guide and direct our lives down the narrow path of obedience so that we can inherit the internal reward of the free gift. We pray that we hold on until the end and overcome all things through a faithful, living faith, Lord Jesus. We pray that we're counted worthy, Lord God. We pray that we please you with our lives, Lord Jesus. We want to be told, well done. My good and faithful servant, Lord Jesus, please continue to cover us with your blood and your grace. Don't let us fall away, Lord Jesus. And if we start to slip, chastise us, Lord God, and keep us in your hands. And Lord God, we thank you for your love and your patience. We thank you so much for the free gift. We thank you for your grace and your teachings. We thank you for teaching us faithfulness and obedience, for dying on the cross, for your blood, Thank you for cleansing us, Lord God. Thank you. We thank you for this Bible study and chat room, Lord Jesus. We pray everyone in here continues to grow in the doctrine of godliness, in holiness, in obedience, in power and grace and faithfulness. We pray everyone continues to grow in their ministry work, in righteousness and godliness, and proving the faith in their own lives, manifesting Jesus daily to the world around them, being strong witnesses and testimonies. We thank you for increasing us in the sun. We thank you, Lord God. We give you praise and glory and honor for this. You alone are worthy to be praised. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.